It's Badminton World, the show that brings you all things badminton from the four corners of the globe. In the next 30 minutes, we feature players who wish to earn their coaching badge once they escape from the glare of the spotlight and a former world champion who has earned his badge, plus the latest world rankings and results only on Badminton World. Coach is the guiding light for any athlete. He or she is the tactician, mentor, confidant and organiser all rolled into one. In short, a coach is the fountain of knowledge. Any athlete wouldn't want to squander the opportunity to have someone who had been in their shoes to act as the teacher. It's no wonder that a natural step for a shuttler to take when he or she calls it a day to become a coach. It's a well-trodden path exemplified by the likes of Lee Yongbo, Park Jubong, Rexi Manaiki, Pulela Gopichan, Kenneth Yonison, Mispun Sidik, Hendra Wan and Joko Suprianto, just to name a few. Earlier there was Christian Hadinata, Han Jiang, Yang Yang and Chen Changji. If you turn the clock further back, you will discover the era of Tang Xian Hu, Fang Kai Xiang and Hu Jiao Chang, all players of repute who made the smooth transition from player to coach. Hadinata remains an influential coaching figure in Indonesia, having been one of the architects of his country's most successful era in the 90s, which yielded a return of eight World Championship titles and four Olympic gold medals. Hadinata, a men's double world champion alongside Ade Chandra in 1980, before carving out a reputation as a coach, credits his success to the previous generation of coaches. founding when you say the founding fathers of badminton in Indonesia, there were plenty of them. There was Tan Yu Ho, Lee Pon Chian, Tan King Guan. They were the ones who elevated Indonesia into a prestigious badminton powerhouse. Para senior senior yang meletakkan bulu tangkis Indonesia berprestasi. Hadinata too has spawned a legacy that he can be proud of. Among his charges was Rexy Manaiki, a men's doubles Olympic gold medalist turned coach. Sebelum saya memang putuskan untuk saya jadi jurulatih itu, waktu saya sudah mau. I made the decision to become a coach just before I retired from badminton. I was constantly consulting Christian Hadinata, asking him what does it take to become a coach. Sometimes I would follow him to his training sessions. Also at that time we had a physical trainer, the late Tahe Side. He gave me a lot of advice on coaching. In the beginning, I used to have a hard time trying to contain my emotions. When we were players, we had no problems letting those emotions out. But as a coach, we have to be in control of everything, especially our emotions. That was the hardest part for me. Control kita punya emosi, biarpun kita sudah tak bisa tahan, tapi gimana kita bisa kontrol itu memang susah di situ saja. Countries outside China and Indonesia are also looking at creating a bigger pool of coaches. Players who have gone through it are all, of course, the preferred choice. England's doubles specialist Alexandra Langley has no qualms of making the switch one day. Um, I'd like to go into coaching. I'd like to coach um, some young players and bring them on and hopefully inspire them to play badminton, especially in England. All work and no play makes Jane a dull girl. So Alex is hoping to be a coach who is able to be tough and occasionally laugh. Well, my coaches are very good. Um, they're very strict, um, but they can also have a laugh. So I think I'd like to ha be fun, but also um, be quite strict as well, so make sure that everyone stays in line. With former All England champ Pulela Gopichan as the benchmark, India's Anand Power is eager to develop his coaching genes inherited from father Uday. I think for sure, I think I will uh, go into coaching because my father is also uh, a coach right now and he has his own uh, training centre, so I think maybe I will take over or have my own, uh, I'm not sure, but I think I will get into coaching for sure. The trick in establishing a successful relationship between coach and player is to create a balance between being a friend and a teacher. I think it's important to have the right mix of uh, being uh, strict and also uh, 
not being friends exactly, but also being a fun coach. I think it's a, it's important to have a good mix uh, if you want to be a good coach and a successful coach. So I think I'll try my best to have uh, both ingredients in. Having played at the highest level is a bonus for Pawar. With their extra insight knowledge, Pawar will be able to impart his skills in what could well be the difference between winning and losing for his players. I think it makes a lot of difference if uh, the coach has also played uh, at a high level. Um, you know, it's, uh, you can make a lot of difference in a match uh, with small uh, you know, changes in tactics and um, you know, things like that. So I think uh, being a former player, um, I think uh, it will be uh, quite helpful for, uh, you know, uh, quite helpful to have played a lot of badminton before be a good coach. For Irish Shetler Sam McGee, who comes from the famous McGee family in Donegal, he intends to give back to the game as a coach. Yeah, definitely, that's what I want to do. I want to give back and try and coach if I can find a job. And maybe yeah, I think I need to start doing some coaching degrees as I'm still playing to try and educate myself more. But I've seen a lot of band and I think I can help uh, the younger players coming through in Ireland. So that's definitely a passion for me. And Sam has a specific area that he would like to develop further when he becomes a coach. I think uh, the technique side of it, I think it really needs to be improved in Ireland. And I think if uh, at the lower level, when the kids are starting, if we can have a better technique, then they will stand themselves a lot better to be better senior players. He doesn't want to be regarded neither as a hard taskmaster nor a lenient coach. I think a lot of people, I do some coaching already, and I think I'm, I think I'm in between. I don't think I'm too strict. I don't think I'm too lenient either. So I think I'd like to find a middle ground between both. Badminton. No sport comes close. Uh, I always like uh, Carsten Wilkinson from Denmark. He uh, has a really, really great style of play. Um, I also like uh, Kukan Kjat from uh, Malaysia. I think he has a really nice style. Uh, definitely Yu Yang and Wang Xiaoli from China. Uh, we, uh, we say that they are almost uh, two uh, boys playing because they are so strong uh, in the ladies' double, so it will be uh, the toughest couple to, to beat. The best net play uh, from Denmark, I think uh, Christina Petersen is a very good. I think overall, again, uh, Kukan Kjad is one of the best net players in the world. I cannot say myself. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I think uh, Carsten Mogensen has uh, the, the biggest smash on the tour. I think we have uh, chances uh, again to take medals to Denmark uh, and, and that's what I'm, I'm most concerned about. I, I hope Denmark can bring home a medal. Coming up next, what would be the most important criteria for a player to become a coach? Stay tuned to find out. Hello, I'm World. Welcome back to Badminton World. Malaysian badminton players are spoilt for choice when it comes to getting good training, as there are many infrastructures as well as training academies set up in order to nurture budding talents. In fact, in every school, community hall and playground in Malaysia, you'll find a badminton court. BAM, which is a sports governing body in Malaysia, trains the current squad at the Juara Stadium in Bukit Kiara, Kuala Lumpur. Plans are underway to redevelop this existing location into a state-of-the-art training centre. Malaysian players will not only benefit from this, but it will become a badminton hub for the region. Besides the National Badminton Academy, there are many other independent academies that have either been opened by our previous badminton players or opened by multinational companies that have the same aim in mind, to turn our badminton players into international superstars. There is no denying that Malaysia is truly committed in ensuring that they produce world-class players. With plans and progress made for the benefit of these players, one cannot deny the fact that one day Malaysia might be a hub for badminton players from all over the world to train. The possibilities are endless for this badminton crazy nation. Back to the issue of players turning to coaching. A fine example of a world champion taking up the challenge of producing champions is Rexy Manaiki. 
1996 Olympic Games gold medalist is now back in Indonesia as head of development, having journeyed to England, Malaysia and the Philippines as a coach. But it was not all a bed of roses for Rexy. Here he offers his advice. If possible, before they retire and decide to become a coach, they must study a lot of things, especially every aspect of coaching. Plus, they must update their current knowledge on other methods, which is employing sports science in their training. We must understand it, because if you talk about teaching skills and techniques, that is not a problem anymore. But now the main aim is to elevate players' performance through sports science. Half of the battle in creating a champion is won if the player is committed to the cause. Therein lays the challenge. It takes two to tango. A coach's task is made easier if his players are determined to succeed. It all boils down to our desire and commitment. But if we lose the desire, then we won't have any commitments. I really emphasize on that. If we talk about skills, yeah, it's important. But the main thing that I stress on is the attitude. Firstly, of course, it's discipline. If there is discipline, automatically the attitude will be positive. If there's no discipline, it's not worth talking about the attitude. So that part is important to me. Rexy's sentiment is shared by 1992 women's singles Olympic gold medalist Susi Susanti. For her, it is all hard work and more hard work, plus a number of other factors as well. Definitely, you have to work hard. You must want to work hard. You must want to train harder because there can only be one champion. So in order to be a champion, you must train extra hard. If you don't go the extra mile, not willing to fight for it, not willing to train, then you will never achieve good results. But a champion may not necessarily be cut out to be a champion coach. But for Susi, it is a learning curve. It's about processes. The process of developing human capital, micromanaging individuals and implementing strategic planning. And she is game for it. For me, everything needs process. It's a constant learning curve. Because when we were players, everything was done for us. But as coaches, we need to lay everything out for the players. So it's a process of learning how to manage each player, learning how to analyse players' style of playing, and tailoring their training. You must also strategize and plan. Plan their training sessions, focus on their weaknesses, all of which must be analyzed. Strategy planning untuk latihan, lalu untuk mungkin juga pemain ini seperti apa, apa yang kurang apa yang itu kan harus semua dianalisa. An active senior player toying with the idea of coaching is Vita Marisa. The double specialist wants to make a difference as a coach. If I have the chance, I would like to try other fields. But because it's my hobby, I may turn to coaching. She talks about Pola and the need to make her charges feel comfortable with her the day she decides to be a coach. If I become a coach, my training methods will be different from other players. For me, I want the players to be at ease when I train them. I want to be close to my players. The process of creating champions is not as simple as ABC. But with an athlete-centred, coach-focused concept, the challenge is much easier to deal with. Having an ex-shuttler sharing his or her decades of experience with their charges is definitely the way forward. Badminton. No sport comes close.
sometimes before a match, a shuttler's mental state is as taut as it is fragile. Under those circumstances, locker room rituals seem crucial. It's like a great big matchstick structure. If every piece is not symmetrically in place, it can all fall down. We spoke to a few former players on their rituals ahead of a game. Right before I went on, it would be... Uh... If I knew that the crowd was going to be uh, tough on me, it would be uh, Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle. Because, you know, you, you, it's you against the crowd and you have to kind of blank that out. So I'll, I'll be hearing that while I was playing. And then otherwise it would be probably Metallica, Enter Sandman. Uh, so a little bit, you know, you against everybody else. That's that kind of music. So it just got me into that frame of mind. I will pray that I will only play well. I will not pray for a win, just that I will play well. If I ask for a win, my opponent will also pray for a win. This will result in the Almighty getting confused, not knowing who to give the win to. So I will pray to only play well, because if I play well, the likelihood that I can win is there. Introduce myself to music, to yoga, to breathing, to alternate um, methods of um, improving performance, whether it's the mental strength or different things. So it really helped me over a period of time. If there's a big match coming, or if I'm playing the next day, I will go shopping or for excursions. I will just take it easy. Coming up on Badminton World, results of the leaning Singapore Open, plus we speak to a former world champion bidding to coach China's top women's singles. My name is Misaki Matsutomo. This is Badminton Watch. Welcome back to Badminton World. The leaning Singapore Open in June became a platform for Indonesia and China to share the honours. Indonesia bagged three while China took home two categories at the Singapore Indoor Stadium. Tontowi Ahmad and Liliana Natsir started the final day well for Indonesia by lifting the mixed doubles after defeating South Korea's Yu Yong Seong and Yom Hai Wan. Then Tommy Sugiarto fully capitalised on the absence of Lin Dan, Chen Long and Lee Chong Wei to take the men's singles title, his first Super Series victory. Playing his first Super Series final, Tommy, son of 1983 world champion Icho, shocked defending champion Bunsak Ponsana of Thailand. While in the women's singles, Wang Yi Han beat compatriot Lee Zuri 21 18 21 12. And in the women's doubles final, China's Qian Qing and Zhao Yunlei maintained their reputation as the pair to beat, as the Olympic champions overcame Japan's Misaki Matsutomo and Ayaka Takashi. Indonesia's third win came from Mohamed Ahsan and Hendra Setiawan, who repeated their win on home ground by defeating Korea's top pair. Now let's take a peek at the world rankings after the Singapore Open. Malaysia's Lee Chong Wei retains his number one spot in the men's singles. And for the first time, Tommy Sugiarto joined the big boys in the top 10 after a streak of excellent play. In the women's singles, Lee Ju Ri still reigns supreme with compatriot Wang Yi Han at number two after going up three spots. Saina Nehual climbed one spot to number three, while Julian Schenk dropped to number four. Thai sensation Rachanok Intanon went down two places to take number five. Despite losing both the Jarum Indonesia Open and Singapore Open finals to the same pair, Ko Su Hyung and Lee Yong Dae are firmly on top of the men's doubles section. There are no changes in the top five men's doubles. The same goes for the women's doubles. No changes in the lineup, with Wang Xiaoli and Yu Yang remained on top. And it's also the same in the mixed doubles. The top five pairs remain unchanged, with China's Zhu Chen and Ma Jin sitting pretty at the top. Next month, all eyes will focus on Guangzhou, China, as top shuttlers battle for honours at the BWF World Championships from August 5th till the 11th. A month after that, it's the BWF World Senior Championships to be held at Ankara, Turkey from September 9th till the 14th. At the same time, the leaning China Masters will take place at Changzhou, China from the 10th till the 15th. 
This will be followed by the Yonex Open Japan on the 17th till the 22nd at Tokyo. For more information, you can visit BWF's official website. This month in our player profile, we speak exclusively to Chen Jin, the 2010 world champion who is adjusting to life as a coach. An athlete usually reaches his or her peak in their late 20s, but as the saying goes, man proposes, God disposes. Just four months after turning 27, Chen Jin has quit badminton. Plagued by injuries, Chen Jin, who bagged the prestigious world title in Paris in 2010, has hung up his racket, but only as a player. He has taken the most natural step, becoming a coach. The reason is mainly due to injuries I have sustained. I am almost 28 years old and still can play if not for the injuries. Chen Jin is now imparting his knowledge to the women's singles team in the Chinese national setup. I have just retired from top badminton action and the experience I have is still very current and relevant. As a coach, I can share my knowledge with the team and younger players so that they can learn from my experience. Is the transition from a player to coach difficult? The transition is not difficult. It's a matter of changing my mindset to focus on the team and not myself. As a player, I only have to take care of my own schedule, diet, training, physical and mental well-being. As a coach, the focus is on the team, caring and managing their physical and mental well-being, on top of coaching. Chen Jin has promised to be a coach who communicates well with his charges. I'm a more easygoing and patient coach. Communication is important between coach and players, especially since I'm coaching the women's singles team from a men's singles player perspective. Therefore, it is important for me to understand the character and temperament of each of the female players and communicate with them effectively so that we can understand each other. As a former world champion, Chen Jin cherishes his memories of climbing the podium. He is therefore in a good position to elevate the standard of players under his wings. I am very happy to be part of the China badminton team. To be in the team, we share and contribute to all our success, glory and failure together. Chen Jin listed the 2010 world title as his greatest achievement. It has to be the 2010 BWF World Championships in Paris. And he has little time for regrets. I can't say that there are any regrets in regards to the 2008 Olympics. Everyone wants to be the winner. Beyond skills, winning is also based on various factors, such as luck and other existing conditions. I have done my best and won a medal, and I am happy about it. And after having created history himself in badminton, Chen Jin will want to continue making new ones for Badminton China. Badminton World wishes him the best of luck. That's all the time we have for you this month, with the exception of this month's selected Super Series moment. Don't forget, if you have a favourite Super Series moment of your own, send it over to badmintonworld at totalsportsasia.com. And as we say goodbye, don't forget we will be back with more news, profiles and interviews. In the meantime, it's farewell for now from Badminton World. It's the world we know.